Taiwan says war with China absolutely not an option. COVID qualms in China dampen Golden Week holiday spending. Nobel Economics Prize goes to Americans for research on financial crises. Iran's women's revolution could be a Berlin Wall moment. EU's MICA crypto law to take effect in 2024. Haiti government asks for international military assistance. Malaysia cuts spending amid global turmoil. Activists glue themselves to Picasso painting. Hello, I'm Johnny. Thank you for joining us on Funday News. It's Tuesday, October 11th, and here are your top stories. President Tsai Ing-wen said on Monday in her National Day speech, I want to make clear to the Beijing authorities that armed confrontation is absolutely not an option for our two sides. Only by respecting the commitment of the Taiwanese people to our sovereignty, democracy and freedom can there be a foundation for resuming constructive interaction across the Taiwan Strait. She said it was regrettable that China had escalated its intimidation and threatened peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait and region. The president said, We will continue to maintain Taiwan's advantages in capacity and leading edge semiconductor manufacturing processes and will help optimize the worldwide restructuring of the semiconductor supply chain, giving our semiconductor firms an even more prominent global role. She also said Taiwan is increasing mass production of precision missiles and high performance naval vessels and working to acquire small, highly mobile weapons that will ensure Taiwan is fully prepared to respond to external military threats. According to China's Ministry of Transport, from October 1st to 7th, 255.5 million people made trips in the country, a fall of 36.4% from the Golden Week holiday last year. The total was also 58.1% down on the same period in 2019. Data from the travel app Hangban Guanjia showed the number of people traveling by plane hit a four-year low of 4.95 million, a 46.8% fall from 2021 and a 62.7% drop from 2020, mostly because this year people were urged to stay close to home and limit movement around cities to minimize the risk of the coronavirus spreading. Chinese National Day is on October 1st. This time, a large number of people enjoyed the Golden Week holiday that runs from October 1st to 7th. According to China's Ministry of Culture and Tourism, travel revenue also fell 26.2% to 287 billion yuan from the same week a year earlier and a 56% fall from 2019. According to data from ticketing platform Mao Yan, revenue from cinemas across the country dropped by 66% to 1.5 billion yuan during the week. Many tourist sites including Jiangjiajie National Forest Park in Hunan Province, Mount La in Shandong, and Ui Mountains in Fujian Province have offered free entry until the end of the year to attract tourists. The Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences was awarded on Monday to Ben S. Bernanke, the former U.S. Federal Reserve Chair, Douglas W. Diamond, an economist at University of Chicago, and Philip H. Dipvig at Washington University in St. Louis, for their research into the banks and financial crises. Mr. Bernanke is now at the Brookings Institution in Washington. The Economics Award, among the highest honors in the field, is not, technically, a Nobel Prize. It is called the Sevier Risk Bank Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel. So he showed that banks need to be there. Uh, they need to be up and running for the economy to work. And if it doesn't, if they don't. According to the New York Times, in 1983, Mr. Bernanke wrote a paper that broke ground in explaining that bank failures can propagate a financial crisis rather than simply being a result of the crisis. Mr. Diamond and Mr. Dibvig, the same year, wrote a paper on the risks inherent in maturity transformation, the process of turning short-term borrowing into long-term lending. Mr. Diamond also wrote about how banks monitor their borrowers, noting that knowledge about borrowers disappears upon bank failures, extending the consequences of the upheaval. Iran Human Rights said at least 185 people, including at least 19 children, have been killed in the nationwide protests across Iran since the September 17th funeral of 22-year-old Masha Amini, anti-government protests have turned into the biggest challenge to Iran's clerical leaders in years, with protesters calling for the downfall of Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, 
CNN said Iran's women's revolution could be a Berlin Wall moment as nationwide protests across the country have sparked hope among many that change is coming. In Tehran this weekend, students chant get lost towards the country's president, heckling him to get off their campus. Iran's state-run broadcaster was apparently hacked on air last Saturday, with a news bulletin interrupted at 9 p.m. by a protest against the country's leader. A mask appeared on the screen, followed by an image of Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei with flames around him. Then, photos of Miss Amini and three other women killed in protests appeared. One of the captions read, Join us and rise up, whilst another said, Our youth's blood is dripping off your paws. The hacker group called itself Adalat Ali, or Ali's Justice. The European Union Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee on Monday voted 28 to 1 in favor of landmark new crypto laws, virtually assuring the passage of legislation that was signed off by the bloc's national governments last week. The Markets in Crypto Assets Regulation, also known as MICA, lets providers of wallets and other crypto services market themselves across the bloc if they register with national authorities and meet minimum guarantees intended to protect investors and maintain stability. The European crypto industry has broadly welcomed the regulatory recognition, even if there are some qualms over the restrictions it places on the use of stablecoins, as well as over uncertainties about whether the rules will apply to non-fungible tokens, or NFTs for short. The law will enter into force between 12 and 18 months after being published in the bloc's official journal, which is likely to happen next spring after being endorsed by the full European Parliament before the end of this year. Advisor to Haiti's Prime Minister Jean Junior Joseph said last weekend that after serious reflections facing a dire humanitarian crisis in Haiti where hospitals are not having enough energy to function, cholera is back inside the shanties. It was decided in the Council of Ministers last night, October 7th, to request military assistance from the international community to deal with such unbelievable humanitarian crisis. CN said it was not clear which countries the government requested military assistance from. Since August 22nd, Haitians have been demonstrating against chronic gang violence, poverty, food insecurity, inflation, and fuel shortages. Haiti's most powerful gangs have exacerbated the fuel crisis by blocking the country's main port in the capital city, Port-au-Prince. People's fury was further fueled last month when Prime Minister Ariel Henry announced he would cut fuel subsidies in order to fund the government while dozens more cases of cholera have been diagnosed in Haiti. On expectations of a decline in revenue and efforts to restructure public spending ahead of a projected global slowdown, Malaysian Finance Minister Tengku Zafru Abdul Aziz tabled a $80 billion U.S. dollars budget for 2023, lower than what the government expects to spend this year. The 2022 budget was revised upwards from the initial figure as surging global crude oil prices caused a sharp increase in a fuel subsidy bill. Zafirul told Parliament when tabling the budget that the global economic situation requires us to continue to be cautious. Turmoil in world geopolitics and the fall in global economic growth surely demands that all nations, not just Malaysia, be careful and flexible to face any eventualities. Barclays Research said the relatively high risk of an early election raises the possibility that the current legislature may not have enough time to debate and approve this budget. CN reported two climate activists with the Extinction Rebellion were arrested Sunday after gluing themselves to a Picasso painting at the National Gallery of Victoria in Melbourne. The activists glued themselves to the glass covering of Picasso's massacre in Korea, standing alongside a banner that read, Climate Chaos Equals War and Famine, highlighting the connection between climate breakdown and human suffering. Victoria's police said a man and woman glued themselves to the covering at around 12.40 p.m. local time.
According to Victoria Police, the 49-year-old woman from the state of New South Wales and a 59-year-old man from the Melbourne suburbs were removed from the painting just after 2 p.m. The two were arrested, as well as a 49-year-old man. Extinction Rebellion said no art was harmed in the incident. The group said, If we continue on our current path, we will face the collapse of everything that gives us our security, leading to conflict. A latest study found the impacts of human-caused climate change were larger than previously thought. Funding News will help you sharpen your English skills and keep you informed about international current events. If you want to know more about our other programs and keep learning about the world's most important topics in English, please click the link in the description below to join Fonday for free. I'm Johnny Wu, your host. I will see you next time.